Our gospel reading is John chapter 21, verses 15 through 23. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Be my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you to take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper, and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that this disciple would not die. And Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But he said, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the word of our Lord.
This morning in our reading, the disciples see the one that they love from their fishing boat. Peter, like a hot rod Charlie, breaks out of the pack and dives into the sea, racing to Jesus who is cooking breakfast on the beach. Peter, at this point, way, way beyond sainthood, and fresh out of the baptismal waters, sits drying like a wet mop in front of the fire. Jesus hands him a plate of bread and fish, and Peter, still a little wet behind the ears, remembers the last time Jesus served him food, the night that Jesus died. The night where his feet were still wet, for Jesus had just knelt down and washed all of the disciples' feet like some house servant. And Peter scolds Jesus, saying, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus replies, Unless I wash your feet, you will have no share with me. These words take on a whole new meaning now for Peter by the fire. At the Last Supper, Peter even boasted at the table, protesting, professing his dying devotional love for Jesus. But we all know how that story ends. Peter's fear and grief overcomes him later, and he publicly denies Christ three times. But this is what fear and grief does to the human heart. It takes our personal, known agenda and throws it right out the window. I mean, grief will rock your world in ways that you might might not know it, and even start behaving, behaving in ways that might even bring you shame. In seasons of stress, seasons of grief, a season of deep loss, maybe you have behaved in a way that might have been embarrassing, bringing you remorse or even shame. Maybe you were under a lot of pressure at work and sent out that angry email. Maybe you were in a season of grief after losing a loved one, and you kept snapping out in some urbanic way. Maybe your world was turned upside down last year, and the pieces left behind ended up becoming sharp weapons to wound with words of hate and anger. But you see, love is no quick race around the track where you place your highly motivated bets, hoping to win some cash for your hidden stash. I mean, I'm working really hard here, folks. <laughs> I know I'm from Texas. Give me a break. Keep in mind, love is less like a horse race on Derby Day where large crowds of folks dress their best drink their midnight bourbon midday, and believe that they will win like a king. There was like six in there. Did you even count them? Okay, thank <laughs> you, thank you, Kathy. No, love is more like a weekly AA meeting, where small groups of struggling folks bring their worst, drink their black bitter coffee, and name their grief their anger, their resentment, their addictions, their deepest losses to the community. Love and loss are the yin and yang to the way of following Christ. But the moment we start experiencing loss, particularly losing in love, the, the helium seeps out of our soul and our egos deflate, causing us to experience different levels of shame. And shame is the enemy of love. Shame strips the essential quality of love itself, of the image of God within us. Shame makes simple questions like, do you love me? Really difficult to answer. Jesus asked, Peter, do you love me? I mean, the question seems easy enough coming from the Son of God who just died and was resurrected for the salvation of the world. 
who is now cooking breakfast on the beach as the sun is rising in some beautiful way. Peter answers quickly, yes, of course, I love you. The question of love is easy when love itself is peering back into you. The question becomes more complex, more difficult when Christ's eyes reflect a deeper reality within yourself. This is what Jesus does. Jesus reveals the truth about love. He says, if you love me, then follow me. Follow me into the places you do not wish to go. Follow me into the depths of love and love. terrifying truth about love occurs when love itself tells you that you're going to lose. Your bets on the race of life will lead you to places that you actually don't want to go. Love calls us all to embark on a difficult journey ahead where we must consciously choose the road that will most likely bring pain, vulnerability, and suffering. Kind of like saying I do in a relationship that you know one day will end. Maybe after 50 plus years of marriage, your beloved spouse dies. Maybe after a long battle with cancer, your friend passes. Maybe after a terrible season of denial and betrayal, you become estranged with that family. Maybe even after a move or a life transition or a hard decision to go in a different direction, you have to leave your community. But this is love. Love and loss. Love is choosing to be in relationship with people who will ultimately let you down at some point. Love is being in relationship with yourself, even though one day, your body will betray you. Love is being in relationship with others who might bring you heartache. Love is being in relationship with God who will lead you in a direction that you may not want to go. Love is a calling from Christ, the dynamic one, the divine one, the resurrected one. This is a call, a call to descend with love itself into the depths of hell, falling all the way down into death, you know, the deepest place of loss. But this, my friends, is the only way to experience resurrection. Love is a journey full of heartbreaks, disappointments, and failures. But these are the stepping stones in a life that moves from ego-driven love to soul-driven love. And this is what Jesus is inviting Peter to search his soul for, this transitioning him from an ego-driven life to a soul-driven life. And a soul-driven life requires a deeper love, a deep look into the eyes of Christ. For if you look long enough into the eyes of love, you will see a glassy image of yourself. It is through Christ's eyes that we begin to see our own reflections. You know, this blurry image of God. It is also when our shadowy selves begin peering back at us, asking difficult questions, like, do you love me? Loving yourself forces you to journey into places you don't want to go, places that will stretch you and pull you across that cross of ego and shame and guilt and regret. These seasons of stretching, seasons of loss, are difficult because 
we start to dig and dig and dig, trying desperately to find our way out of the messiness and the madness and the mundaneness of our lives. And then suddenly our shovels hit the bedrock at the bottom. And we realize we have dug a grave. But it is here where we can finally stand up straight. Stand with Christ six feet under. Peter answers the second question, standing in the grave of Jesus. And the grave is a good place to put our feet on solid rock. The grave is where we also bury our brokenness in order to be restored, to be made whole through love. And the stinking, rotten truth about love is that it never promises safety or security. It calls us to follow, to follow with faith, follow down the painful path where we must die over and over over again. You know those really hard roads where you find yourself with little in the bank account or in the hospital bed or on job interviews or in chemo treatments, on dating websites, in bedrooms turned to classrooms, on couches instead of pews, in bodies that have grown old, in funeral homes full of goodbyes, in houses that are now way too quiet, in churches that have changed too much, in your bed that keeps you from sleep, in a world that keeps your heart apart. These are the roads, seasons full of depression, guilt, loneliness, resentment, anger, bitterness, a world first of all, full of shame. But then Easter comes, a season when we remember the resurrection of Christ. And this involves being able to locate our own stories full of poor choices, full of wrong decisions, of mean words, of estranged relationships, of shouting matches, of regretful actions, of guilt-filled thoughts, of shameful feelings. We locate them. We look them in the eye and let them die. Let them go. Let them become seeds in the grave that will help us grow. Maybe these seeds are planted, planted by you, when you tell somebody you're sorry. Or you see that therapist for your anger and resentment. Maybe these seeds come from confessing your secret sin. It is here that these seeds are sown in our own stories where we can locate and liberate by means of grace. For it is in our brokenness, our losses, that we create space for grace. That we can break free from shame and guilt and move towards healing and wholeness. Above all, no matter what season of life you are in today, we can acknowledge that death cannot and does not win. And yet, love wins through death. Ah, but we prefer anything to change, anything to loss, anything to death. We would rather not remember and keep moving forward, pretending that we aren't hurt or haven't hurt others, that we aren't suffering or that others aren't suffering, that there's no pain. But there's Jesus. Jesus who keeps calling us back to the table, like he calls Peter to the beachside breakfast buffet and asks him for a third time. Do you love me? I imagine that question echoes in the hollow pits of Peter's soul 
a place deep within each of us, a place where you can't help but see your own warts and your wrinkles and your pimples and your scars, a place where love feels awkward, like accidentally sending the wrong text message to your girlfriend's father. But this, this place, this is where we can finally look into the mirror, past our shame, past our brokenness, past our failures, and we can even say to ourselves, I love you. I love you. I love you. For this is what love does. It keeps us in relationship with self and with others. This is the love that renews and resurrects Peter's spirit, calling him back into deep relationship with the flock. Peter loves Christ. Peter loves himself, and now he can fully love the community all around him. And this is what love does. It expands our vision, opening our eyes to see all those in our community around us, to see the entire body of Christ, Scarred and broken, whole and holy, earthly and eternal. Oh, but it also requires us to be honest. And over time, the body of Christ, the church, has collected and inflicted more scars and broken bones. We also must remember the ugly parts of our own history. We must look at the body of Christ, the history of the church, and see the truth, warts and all. Those horrible moments where justice was failed in the pulpit. Those grieving moments where beloved members were lost. And yes, we too can even remember the wonderful moments where ministry and missions impacted the lives of others in the name of love. Yes. The church has said wrong words, has used God's love as means to inflict more shame and guilt on the others. Like words like, love the sinner, hate the sin. The church has twisted over time scripture and promoted even the oppression of women and people of color. The church has used God's missions, God's saving work in the world to enslave countries and profit from cheap labor. Yes, the church is broken. It's full of hypocrites. It's led by humans who make mistakes. It's filled with people who allow fear to dictate their faith. Yes, the church, even our church, can be frustrating and maddening and drive you crazy. Ah, but we often forget that the church has always and will always be a bunch of losers, failures, bubbling and stumbling around in scripture and tradition to somehow find a way to follow the way, the truth, and life. We forget that the church was built upon broken rocks like the Apostle Peter. We forget that in her brokenness, like in our brokenness, the church can still hold love and lost in a powerful duo that keeps us moving towards people. Towards others who look different, think different, love different, live different, believe different. Jesus speaks this same truth at the Last Supper around the table with his friends. Friends who would deny and betray him. He says to them, by this they will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And love, let me remind you, is never ego-driven, only soul-driven. And soul-driven people flock together. And we, we are keeping this faith, holding on to hope, allowing love to move our flock into new pastures. Communities like ours, who keep choosing to put love first, loving one another in word and deed, will end up spreading God's love to those in ways that they might not ever imagine. Remember 
here, our church is rooted in the love of Jesus Christ. And all we do here, all of our ministry and missions, keeps putting love first. And God's love doesn't have to be shared in some mega church way. I mean, love. Love is often best given in small gifts of grace. This past week, I got a text message about how well our church loves. This week, the Rohitter family got some terrible news about Tom's sister. She was diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer. I mean, talk about finding yourself in a season of fear, pain, and loss. But this week, when she went to the hospital and was given this painful port in her body, guess what else she was given to ease her suffering? A small pillow, a cushion that could be placed on the seat belt to help ease her pain on her way home. This small cushion of grace, this tiny pillow, was made by one of our missions groups, Threads and Things. She sent to our church a warm thank you the small act of love that gave her hope in this difficult season of suffering. This, this is how we feed the sheep around us. By keep giving those small cushions of God's grace, God's love to those around us.